Hello and welcome to the first edition of the Columbia Daily Tribune's Behind the Stripes webcast, which will be similar to the podcast we did last year, except for you can now see us as we talk to each other and to you. Uh, I'm sports editor Joe Waljasper. This is the Tribune's football beat writer, Dave Matter. And this will be our first, uh, first edition of the uh, 2009 season. First of all, Dave, let's talk a little bit, maybe some big picture stuff. Uh, kind of the theme about uh, around the team here in the offseason was whether they're a team that's capable of reloading after losing six NFL caliber players, six guys who were drafted, or is it a team that's going to, you know, it's had their run and now they're going to kind of sink back into a more familiar ground of a, of a so-so team. Do you think they're the kind of team that can, that can uh, come back and contend for the North even after losing that many quality players? Well, this is going to be the defining year that, that you know, answers that question, whether it's going to be a, a pretty good year where you can win eight, nine games and go to a decent bowl game or where you fall back to, to hoping to play in the postseason. I think Missouri, the best thing going for it as far as reloading and not rebuilding is that they still play in the Big 12 North not the Big 12 South, where there is no perennial um, elite team. I think it's a three-team race this year with Missouri, Kansas, and Nebraska, and it could all come down to that last weekend, that Thanksgiving weekend, because I think that on paper, the programs and the personnel that they bring back are, are pretty equal. So in that case, um, you know, they could all be seven and five, but I, I still think there's enough parity to where Missouri can continually reload with the talent they're bringing in with their recruiting classes and be okay. I guess my concern with Missouri is not so much the inexperience because when you look at it, they played a lot of freshmen last year, maybe guys they didn't even have to play, but they kind of played with an eye looking forward to the future. Right. Blaine Gabbert, an obvious one. Dan Hoke on the offensive line. There's a bunch of them we could talk about. So I don't know that inexperience is as big a concern to me as do you have the kind of high-level game-changing type players, guys who are clearly better than the average Big 12 player at their position. I mean, I think you could definitely say that about Sean Weatherspoon at linebacker. I don't know a whole lot of other guys that you would, at, at this point, come around and say, this guy is clearly head and shoulders above the average Big 12 player. Now, hopefully, obviously, Blaine G Gabbert can get there, but as a first-year starter, that's a little tough to say. And I guess maybe the biggest difference I think we're going to see is, is on offense, where you're just so used to having so many guys who right. can change a game and, and break an 80-yard play. It's going to be a little bit different if you have to go 10, 5 yards at a time down the field. You've got to be pretty precise with what you're doing. Uh, so that's kind of the thing I'm going to be interested in seeing. They've, I know they're high on you know the team speed, the recruiting, recruiting classes they've had the last few years. They're always emphasizing speed. So we'll see if it pays off or not. But I guess just just from what we've seen of these players last year, you're just a little curious as to whether they are high-end Big 12 players. Uh, lots of changes in the offseason, namely on the coaching staff with some of the biggest ones. They, uh, Matt Eberflus, the defensive coordinator, goes to the Cleveland Browns. Uh, Dave Christensen, the offensive coordinator, goes to Wyoming to be the head coach. So now they switched it up. They have Dave Steckel as the defensive coordinator. They bring in Barry Odom to coach the safeties. And then on the offensive side, they, they bring in Josh Henson to help coach the offensive line. They move the tight ends coach over to coach the offensive line also. And then David Yost, the quarterback coach, also the offensive coordinator. After that long introduction, <laughs> what sort of differences do you think we see on both sides of the ball based on the different uh, coordinators? I think the differences that we'll see will be sort of subtle. I don't think there's going to be any major drastic changes. They're not going to all of a sudden come out in a 3-4 defense. They're not going to line up in the wishbone and probably, at least from what we've seen in practice, not be that drastic in, in goal line and sh in short yardage situations. They're still a spread offense. They're still going to have empty set backfields, four and five receivers wide. Uh, so for the most part, I, I think what they look like is going to be fairly similar. What they do might be a little different. I think you're going to see more running the ball with Derek Washington, with Devin Moore, and with the freshman Kendall Lawrence, I think. Um, you know, last year Missouri was about a 60-40 pass to run team. They want to get back to more 50-50 um, and, and be a, more balanced because uh, they have the running backs to be able to do that. They don't necessarily have the experience of quarterback or receiver to really rely on, on being that pass heavy like they were a year ago. In 2006, Chase Daniels, first year as a starter, they were almost on the nose 50-50 run pass and I think that's what they'd like to get back to and they certainly have the running backs to be able to do that. Uh, on defense, you know, I, I think so much of it is about attitude, it's about discipline and the differences that, that Steckel brings in his leadership style and in his, in his uh, personality than, than what Matt Eberflus had and I think that's a positive change for this defense. How many times last year did we see them look so lost and confused 
and the, the communication back there was just a mess. Uh, I think Matt Eberflus was, was a good defensive coach. I think he, he knew what he was doing in 2007. He didn't certainly, he didn't all of a sudden, you know, lose his, his ability in 2008. But something needed, uh, there needed to be a change, I think. And I think what Steckel brings, his, his fiery personality, and, and it, not just personality, but he's been waiting a long time for this opportunity. He's got a lot of ideas. He's probably not going to share them with us so much. But, uh, you know, I, he's, he's ready for this. He's prepared, so it'll be interesting. I thought physically last year, defensively, they were good enough. Um, it was all, I really, I guess, kind of felt like if the defensive coaches had just spent the whole summer at Lake of the Ozarks and not thought about <laughs> football whatsoever, they'd have been better off because I think they got the idea in, in their heads, we've got all these guys coming back, we can do all these different things. And, you know, even 11 games in the season, they didn't seem to know what coverage they were in. Right. I think if they just kept it a little simpler, they physically were good enough. So many times you'd see them, you know, put teams in third and 12 and then just get the ball thrown over the top on them. I think just based on simplifying things a little bit, which I think he's going to do, uh, that will help over there. Because I, I think they got decent players over there. Right. I, I'd really expect them to be a better defense this year. Offensively, I haven't seen anything that I didn't see last year. And I haven't seen... I guess I, I don't see a whole lot of change there. Uh, I think people were crossing their fingers and hoping that they would go under center and have a fullback and this and that. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, we haven't seen it yet in practice. Right, okay. So you know, if they're not going to do it in practice, it's hard to expect them to do it during the games. I think another difference is the offensive line changes. Uh, having two guys coach the line, I, th I think that's a, a positive move for this group. The, the players seem to really like it. They say that there's nothing that gets by these two coaches watching them every step. Josh Henson is a guy with a different kind of offensive background, played at Oklahoma State under Les Miles, coached at LSU under Les Miles, not necessarily known for, a, for its spread, sort of finesse running style. He comes from the, the three yards in a cloud of dust background, and, and I think he's gradually kind of uh, sharing some of those philosophies and techniques with the linemen. They, they really love, you know, working for him and Bruce Walker. So I think that's another good change. Missouri's offensive lines in recent years, I think they've did, done a good job of keeping Chase Daniel clean. But sometimes when you need a yard or two, they weren't guys that were driving off the ball and hitting people. And that, may, that part of it may change. I think you're right about that. Uh, early impressions of Blaine Gabbard, I think we both think pretty clearly he is the starter. And that's kind of part A of the question. Part B, um, what's the situation with his backup, I think? You hear a lot of uh, good comments from the coaches about Jimmy Costello, a, a former, perhaps current walk-on. I think yeah. he's going to be a scholarship guy right. if he's not already. Um, and then you got the two true freshmen behind him. Well, they really like Jimmy Costello and the way that he manages the offense. They say physically he can do everything you need to do in this offense, and he's smart. They trust him, and that's the that's the biggest thing with the backup quarterback. You have to be able to trust the guy in case something happens to the starter. The other two options are both true freshmen. I think they look a little bit better, more comfortable now than they did in the spring. But still, that they're they're so young, they're so inexperienced. And uh, Costello, so far, I think you can trust him out there to at least not lose the game for you um, in a game that you should win. So th they really seem to trust him. He's a popular guy. They they love his attitude. He's really smart. So I, I'd be surprised if it's not him. I guess the question becomes: Do you want your backup to be a guy who can come in and change the game? You know, like. For instance, if you're looking for a guy who could run, I guess, for, for lack of a better term, something like the Wildcat, and the, people talk about that, you know, a guy who's a really good runner, you could have Blaine Dalton do that if that's what you're looking for, or do you want a guy, if Blaine Gabbard gets hurt, that isn't going to screw things up. Yeah. It kind of, we'll see what their philosophy is, I think, based on who, the, who they run out there. And the other factor is you have two guys, two quarterbacks in the same grade, um, do you want to separate those by redshirting one or the other, or do they care much? I don't even know if that's a factor much because in 2010 you, they've got a commitment from a quarterback out of Dallas uh, who, who's really uh, physically looks pretty impressive. And, uh, you know, so you're always looking for the next guy. They've got another quarterback commitment for 2011. So uh, I, th I don't know if they look that far ahead as far as what they're doing uh, with this group particularly. And then you're just your impressions of Gabbard so far. I've been impressed. Uh, he's, he's much more decisive and deliberate with, with passing the ball than, than I expected for him to be. He's accurate enough, I think. Um, his arm strength is, is not a question. We, we all know how strong his arm is. But I, I really liked how, uh, how quickly he gets the ball out and, and he knows where it's going. So that, that, I think, was a thing that everyone assumed would take a while to develop for, for a fairly young guy. And he still has to do it against live competition in scrimmages and, and especially on Saturdays, but so far so good, I think. And he's a huge guy. Yeah, it's so much bigger than what they've had there in the last couple of years. So he physically has everything you want, and 
from what I've seen, he, he's been making, I think, pretty good decisions from what we saw in the spring and then what little I've seen at least. Right, and the standard's very high with Chase Daniel, who, who completed, I think, 64% of his passes as, as a first-year starter um, and was up around 70% last year. So the, the bar's pretty high. But in this offense, you don't throw a lot of really hard-to-make downfield passes. I think he should, he should be in that 60% range for sure. Um, what positions do you think the most heated battles or the most competition for starting jobs uh, are you seeing so far? I think that other defensive tackle spot next to Jerron Baston, who, who's the most experienced defensive lineman, you've got Terrell Rosano, a sophomore, and Dominique Hamilton, a sophomore. I think both will play a lot, but it just comes down to who's the starter. Uh, defensive end, you've got three guys who are, who are playing for two starting positions, but all three will play. Alden Smith, Brian Coulter, and Jacquees Smith. I think you can't go wrong with any of those two because they're going to be pretty good at defensive end. But, but that's a place to look. And I think at cornerback also, you've got six guys. Gary Pinkle said it after Tuesday's practice. They are legitimately six deep uh, with all six who will see the field in some capacity this year in their nickel and dime situations. But, but they've got good depth there, and, and they need it because, you know, in, when you play in the Big 12, uh, you're going to have some issues defending the pass at times, so they have to have depth there. And uh, another spot, I would say wide receivers still, not so much for the starting jobs. I think we know who's going to start. It's, it's who's going to fill in because Missouri really wants to distribute the ball and throw it around. Last year they had three guys catch at least 70 passes. I don't think it's going to be that top-heavy this year. I think it's going to be spread out a little bit more, a few guys in the 50s and the 40s. Um, so it's, there's still some backup jobs to be won. And this offense, backup is kind of relative to turn at wide receiver because they'll go five or six deep. You said you know who the stars are. The narrow Alexander, Jared Perry, and who you think And, and Wes Kemp is there right now, and he's looked pretty good. I, th I think he'll be one of their outside receivers for sure. Okay, and then just, I guess, uh, lastly, um, what you've seen of the newcomers this year, which of those guys do you think could play this season? Well, Kendall Lawrence, the, the tailback from Texas, has been impressive from day one. Um, you know, Missouri doesn't give a lot of carries in the past to the number three back, and they've got a, a very good start in Derek Washington and a good backup in Devin Moore, but I think they're going to have to find ways to get uh, Kendall Lawrence the ball because he's, he's been really impressive in camp against any defense that he goes against and any offensive line he's behind, so he's one for sure. Uh, also, LaDamian Washington, the wide receiver from, from Shreveport, Louisiana, a real late addition to their recruiting class. That guy is, is extremely skinny. He looks a lot like Jared Perry did when he was a freshman, but all he does is he's catch the taller, ball. He, yeah, that? he's a lot taller, but he's but he's really thin. Um, but but he he's, all he does is catch the ball. They have they have him returning punts right now also. So I think he could be a factor. And interestingly enough, Gary Pinkle said uh, this week that that they could play another true freshman on the offensive line. They did a year ago at Dan Hoke as a backup. He's now the starting right tackle. Uh, presumably it would be Jack Miners, another big tackle kid out of St. Louis who is legitimately six six, three hundred and five pounds. Uh, when you get kids that big coming in from high school, and if they're smart enough to, to handle the offense and to learn it all, they, they can play right away. So they could use him into a backup job at, at tackle, too. So it'll be interesting to see. All right, Dave, thanks. Uh, that will wrap up our first edition of the webcast. And this will be a weekly feature. We'll try to have it on each Wednesday running through the end of the season.